We all know Rare, the British game developer best known for their time working as a second party at Nintendo. But did you know that before their official partnership with Nintendo, Rare was responsible for the very first NES game developed outside of Japan, and they released over 40 games for the platform in only 5 years? Welcome to Rare Retrospective, a series where I explore the catalog of classics and flops released by Rare throughout their 40 year history. Today we're going to be talking about some of Rare's most notable releases for the Nintendo Entertainment System and the beginnings of their partnership with Nintendo. And if you're interested in seeing where else the series takes us, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Last time, we talked about Rare's origins as Ultimate Play the Game and their historic releases on the ZX Spectrum home computer system. If you're interested in this period of Rare's history, there's a link to the Spectrum video on screen, but it's not necessary to watch before you watch this one. In the early to mid-1980s, Rare's founders Tim and Chris Stamper were dominating the British games market with their releases on the ZX Spectrum as Ultimate Play the Game. The Spectrum was mostly popular in the UK though, so the brothers saw it as a sort of dead end for company growth. While they were still developing on the Spectrum, they turned their eyes to foreign game consoles, and Nintendo's Famicom in particular. While video game consoles were crashing in the West and software developers were jumping ship to home computers, the Famicom was rocketing upwards in sales in its home territory while being significantly more suitable for games than the Spectrum was. So the Stampers decided to bet on Nintendo's ability to market the console outside of Japan, imported a Famicom, and got to work. They founded a new company to focus solely on the Famicom while Ultimate Play the Game continued to develop for the Spectrum. And that company was Rare. But Nintendo wasn't in the habit of granting development licenses for the Famicom to companies outside of Japan, so Rare had its work cut out for it. Without dev kits or instructions from Nintendo, Rare had to reverse engineer the Famicom themselves in order to start development on it. After creating a few tech demos for the platform, Rare managed to set up a meeting with Nintendo to show them what they had created. Nintendo was very impressed by both the demos they were shown and the ingenuity required to create them without any official development tools. They were so impressed that they granted Rare a massive budget to create games for the Famicom and NES. The Stampers immediately focused all their resources onto the new platform, selling Ultimate Play the Game to US Gold in the process. While Nintendo was funding some games for Rare, they didn't own any stake in the company, and Rare remained completely independent during this period, creating whatever games they wanted to. And they created a lot. There were essentially two types of games Rare put out on the NES. Creative, ambitious, original titles, and slop. So much slop. Rare took a firehose approach to releases on the NES, flooding the platform with games at an average of more than one per month. Lots of these games were tie-ins to other properties like Sesame Street ABC or Wheel of Fortune, while others were NES conversions of other companies' games like Marble Madness or Pirates. I can't talk about all these games. I don't want to talk about all of them, and I'm sure you don't want to listen to me talk about all of them. Lucky for us, the 2015 Xbox One release Rare Replay features 8 of their NES classics, and it serves as a pretty good curated list of Rare's NES games that are actually worth taking a look at. In this video, I'm going to be talking about most of the NES games found in Rare Replay, but there's one notable inclusion I won't be going into detail on. Battletoads. Battletoads is probably Rare's most well-known NES game in the present day, and it spawned a short-lived franchise in the 90s which was revived in 2020. In the near future, I intend to make a retrospective video dedicated to the Battletoads franchise as a whole, so I'll be saving most of my discussion of the game for that video. Aside from that, there's a lot of NES games we won't be discussing at all in this video, but if you really want to see the garbage Rare shoveled out onto the NES, drop a comment below and maybe I'll do a video dedicated to the worst of Rare's NES releases. The first game Rare developed for Nintendo, and the first NES game developed outside of Japan at all, was Salam, one of the tech demos they showed in their meeting with Nintendo executives. Nintendo themselves published Salam in 1986 on their Nintendo vs. system in arcades with a home version releasing the following year. Salam is a simple time trial game where you ski down a series of courses with strict time limits. Along the way there are obstacles to avoid such as trees and other skiers, as well as moguls you can launch off of to perform tricks. There are three slopes you can choose from, Snowy Hill, Steep Peak, and Mount Nasty. After you've completed every course from your selection, the game starts putting you on courses from all three. Once you get onto a course, you need to get to the bottom as quickly as possible while passing through as many Salam gates as you can and avoiding trees, snowmen, children on sleds, and rival skiers. Passing a flag on the wrong side will forcibly apply your brakes for a moment, costing you time. Colliding with obstacles will either knock you off balance and dramatically slow you down, or knock you over completely, burying you in the snow for a moment. Salam's controls are very smooth. 
The D-pad controls your speed and turning while the A button jumps. The turning and acceleration feel good, and the game is very fun to control when you've picked up a lot of speed. I also find Salam's visuals to be very impressive for the late 80s, and the parallax scrolling and the way obstacles grow as you approach are convincing and create a really nice sense of speed. Compared to other early NES releases, it's not hard to see why Nintendo was so impressed by Salam. Feels like I'm wearing nothing at all! Nothing at all! Nothing at all! So this game looks good, feels good to control, and the gameplay is fun. At first. Once you start skiing the harder courses, the difficulty curve takes a very dramatic upward spike. As you would expect, the harder courses have more obstacles, more rival skiers, and stricter time limits. I might just be bad at the game, but after I completed a handful of courses, they very suddenly went from being fun and easy to clear in one or two tries, to obstacle-littered nightmares with target times that felt next to impossible to achieve without accelerating for the entire race and memorizing every obstacle's exact position. Salam can be really fun for a little bit, but the difficulty is just not balanced very well, and it quickly stops being fun as a result. I think the game was designed with the expectation that the player will have to memorize most of the game's courses, but that's a lot to ask. High difficulty is how older games stretch their content out to last longer than an afternoon, but I felt like Salam got too difficult too quickly and it could've used more intermediate courses. Or maybe I just need to get good. Who can say, really? After Salam, Rare was still working up momentum on the NES and releasing games at a slower pace. Their second release was Wizards & Warriors, a side-scrolling action platformer published by Acclaim. Wizards & Warriors is pretty cool and it spawned a few sequels and I probably should talk about it at some point. Not today though, because it's not in Rare Replay, and if I don't stay focused, this video is going to turn into four hours of talking about game show adaptations and arcade ports. Their very next game was in Rare Replay though, RC Pro-Am, another Nintendo-published game. RC Pro-Am is a top-down racing game where you pilot a remote-controlled toy car around a track to compete against three rival cars across a campaign consisting of 24 unique tracks. During the race, you can pick up missiles and bombs and use them to hinder other racers. RC Pro-Am's defining feature, though, is its upgrade system. Each track contains scattered car parts you can collect during a race to permanently upgrade your car. These upgrades persist across races, and since your opponents get dramatically faster as the game progresses, collecting them is extremely important to not get bodied in later tracks. There are also little tiles with letters on them you can collect scattered around the tracks, which spell out either Nintendo or Champion depending on which version you're playing. Once you've spelled out the whole word, your entire car is upgraded with a completely new sprite, and then your upgraded car can be further upgraded by collecting more parts in races. And then if you spell the word again, you get a third model of car which once again can be fully upgraded with parts scattered around the tracks. Upgrading your car is a core focus of the game from start to finish, and it is crucial not to fall behind, because as you might expect from Rare or the NES in general, this game gets very difficult. Your biggest saving grace is the fact that you only have to beat one opponent to place in the top three, because if you place him fourth three times, the game will no longer give you the option to try again. Even if you keep up on upgrading your car, the other racers get extremely fast extremely quickly. Missiles and bombs help a lot, but if you use them too much, the yellow car accelerates to impossible speeds and immediately wins the race. Speedruns actually abuse this behavior, since the race ends the instant anyone crosses the finish line, and you only need to place in the top three. That pretty much describes the whole game, and I gotta say, RC Pro-Am rules. It was one of the first games to combine vehicular combat with racing, and essentially pioneered a genre and paved the way for games like Mario Kart. And it still holds up today, shockingly well. It's a fun little racing game with a cool upgrade system, and not only is it still fun, but I think it's still visually pleasing as well. The colors are nice, the sprites are detailed, and it doesn't really have slowdown or flickering problems either. RC Pro-Am can get pretty frustrating on later tracks, but unlike Salam, it feels mostly fair as long as you don't piss off the fun police in the yellow car, and it really holds up. It's in the Nintendo Switch Online app, and I highly recommend giving it a try if you're subscribed to that. After RC Pro-Am, Rare released... a deluge of garbage. And then they released Cobra Triangle, which is actually a really sick game! Cobra Triangle is an isometric action game in which you take control of a speedboat and must complete numerous difficult trials. 24 of them, to be exact. Your ship is equipped with a gun that can be fired at any time, but aside from that, you're just a simple boat. There are 24 missions, which all fit into one of eight categories. Racing, collecting scattered items, disposal of mines, guarding swimmers, shooting targets, avoiding obstacles, jumping waterfalls, and battling sea monsters. As you progress through the stages, you can permanently upgrade your boat by collecting pods. 
The upgrade system is fairly unique. Collecting a pod makes one of your instruments start flashing in the HUD, and collecting more pods will change which one is flashing. Pressing select while an instrument is flashing upgrades it so you can decide what to prioritize. You can upgrade your acceleration, firing rate and pattern, and top speed with the first three options. The fourth one permanently adds a missile launcher to your ship which can then be further upgraded, and the last one, Force, repairs all damage to your boat and temporarily grants invulnerability and homing missiles. Cobra Triangle's greatest strength is its variety of content. The game is constantly throwing new things at you, and it's fun to see what you have to deal with next. The racing stages are simple time trials with enemy boats trying to get in your way, mounted guns firing at you from the shores, and ramps that let you skip parts of the river. You don't actually have to beat any enemy ships to cross the finish line, you just have to get there within the time limit. The races are really fun and probably my favorite type of level in Cobra Triangle. Pod collection stages are basically bonus stages. You sail down a looping river until time expires, going off jumps to collect pods and other pickups as you go. These stages are very good for powering up your craft, and they conveniently place one right near the start of the game. Actually colliding with things in the air can be kinda of frustrating though. The perspective makes judging position difficult, and the hitboxes feel a little off. Mine disposal requires you to transport a set number of mines to a designated area for detonation. While you try to transport them, two enemy boats will try to take them back to where you collected them from. The enemies are both indestructible and faster than you, so you have to swerve around and outmaneuver them to keep them off you. These levels are kinda fun, but the enemies are maybe a bit overtuned in the later stages. Swimmer guarding stages place 8 people in a designated space in the water. For the entire stage, countless enemy ships will sail in from all directions to attempt to kidnap the swimmers before making a beeline for one of the exits at the edges of the map. There's also a UFO that flies by and fires homing missiles that briefly stun you, which are the big threat that stops you from just spinning in place with the shoot button held down. The more swimmers you rescue, the more points you get, plus a 1-up if all 8 survive. But to pass the stage, only one needs to make it to the end, so you can focus all your efforts on protecting one guy, and the level is more or less impossible to lose. The target shooting stages are labeled as bonus stages, but the game does count them as a mission. You're stuck on rails that can only spin in place as you drift down the river with targets placed on each bank. There are also little missiles on posts you can shoot, which grant a temporary homing missile power-up. If you manage to shoot every target, you get a 1-up at the end of the stage. The Reach the Finish stages have you sail upstream while obstacles float downstream towards you. The initial version of the stage just has logs to avoid, as well as whirlpools that will launch you in a random direction if they don't sink you outright. It's not too difficult, as the logs just bounce off you out of your way if you do hit one, but later versions of the stage are much harder, replacing the logs with icebergs that erupt out of the water suddenly and repeatedly. There are indicators for where they're going to pop up, but you don't really have enough time to react to a lot of the ones in later stages, where they'll also move around in different patterns. And unlike the logs, the icebergs stay mostly in place if you hit them, instead of politely moving out of the way. These stages are pretty fun, but the icebergs can be very frustrating. The waterfall jumping levels have you sail down a course making jumps over huge chasms. You have to hit the ramp at an angle that won't send you onto the riverbank with enough speed to cross the gap. To complicate things, the ramps move back and forth and the river is full of whirlpools to knock you off course. These levels are very hard and require a lot of patience and precision. And finally we have the boss fights. On stages 5, 10, 17, 23, and 24 you'll fight a sea monster. You need to maneuver around their attacks while attacking them yourself and defeat them within the time limit. These fights are extremely difficult as the battlefield is very small, the monsters take up most of it, and boats aren't particularly known for easy maneuverability in tight spaces. Their attacks hit hard, are very difficult to avoid, and some of them can just kill you instantly, but if you can manage to go into a boss with a force upgrade ready to go, they're completely trivialized by it. Once you've finished all 24 stages, you're placed into level 25, which is a brief ending sequence where you rescue downed fighter pilots, which I guess was the goal of the game? The manual basically just describes how to play the game without providing any story, but the enemy design and ending imply you're involved in some sort of war. All in all, Cobra Triangle is a really cool and interesting experience. The gameplay variety is really impressive as well. The only NES game I've played that mixes things up as much as this is Battletoads, and that's also a rare release. After Cobra Triangle, Rare once again put out a stream of shovelware and conversions, eventually leading up to the 1990 release Snake Rattle and Roll. Snake Rattle and Roll takes you into the fun-filled world of two of the hippest snakes around, Rattle and Roll. The game is an isometric platformer because Rare has been obsessed with isometric games for like 6 years at this point. There are 11 stages to play through, with the objective of each being to eat enough nibbly pibblies to grow heavy enough to activate the scale to open the exit door. Eating enough will add a segment to your tail, and taking damage will cost you a tail segment. Rattle and Roll also have different preferences and enjoy different colored nibbly pibblies more than others. 
The Nibbly Pibbly family is large and varied. When they spawn, they'll often change to one of many different forms, which the manual helpfully names. Throughout your adventure, you will encounter Pibbles, Pibble Boings, Pibble Joggers, Pibble Splats, Pibble Bats, Pibble Fish, and Pibble Copters. Each type of Nibbly Pibbly behaves differently, with some of them being pretty annoying to catch. And sometimes you think you're about to eat a Nibbly Pibbly, but it's actually just a Nibbly Pibbly shaped bomb. One of the biggest draws of Snake, Rattle, and Roll at the time of release was its simultaneous multiplayer mode. Before and during the NES generation, it was very common for multiplayer to require taking turns, with simultaneous play being relatively uncommon in early releases. In a two-player game, the players are working together to complete each level, but comparing to see who has the highest score at the end. Snake, Rattle, and Roll is absolutely designed to be played with two players, as the end-of-level results screen will always show both snakes when it tallies your score, even if the other one wasn't present at all. The controls in this game aren't necessarily bad, but I wouldn't call them good either. The snakes are very slippery, and the entire game kind of feels like it's on ice until you reach the later stages that are literally made of ice, at which point it feels like you're on greased ice. It's incredibly easy to land a tricky jump and then just slide right off the other side of the platform you landed on. The controls also just don't make sense to me, because the game supports full 8-way movement, but the controller is mapped as if it doesn't. Cardinals and inner cardinals are swapped, so for example, pressing left will go northwest, pressing up will go northeast, and pressing up and left will go straight north. It feels weird and wrong, and I never really got completely used to it, but to be fair, this was their first isometric game with 8 degrees of movement. Getting hit by an enemy with no tail segments will kill you. Getting squished will kill you. Landing on a sharp object will kill you. Running out of time will kill you. Falling more than 4 vertical blocks will kill you. A lot of things in Snake, Rattle, and Roll will kill you. There are limited lives and limited continues, which you will likely burn through very quickly in the later stages, as the platforming the game asks of you starts to get downright sadistic. Look at this level. Everything is made of slippery ice. Most of the floor is made up of slopes you have to constantly push against to not slide off as you slowly inch your way to the side, while the game is launching snowballs at you that will roll over you and instantly flatten you if you fail to jump over them. And then they stop putting walls behind the slopes, so if you push against an incline for longer than a second you'll drop off the other edge, but if you stop pushing for longer than a second you'll slide off, requiring a constant feathering while still inching to the side. And since it's a rare game, it's from a perspective that doesn't make any sense on a controller with a plus-shaped input method. At least the death animation is fun. You'll be seeing it a lot. Thankfully, there are hidden warps, including one in level 1 that jumps all the way to level 8, so it's not too time-consuming to get back to where you were when you game over. While they do have a tendency to get a bit unreasonable, the level design is overall interesting and fun. Each level feels pretty different from the last, and the difficulty increases on a reasonable curve, even if the later stages are downright mean. As long as you don't mind some frustration, the game is really cool and enjoyable all the way up until level 11. Level 11 is awful. While the first 10 levels had you eating nibbly pibblies to open exit doors, the 11th level is a boss fight. You're on a small race platform that's constantly being bombarded by meteors, and there's a big foot. In a gross display of the developer's barely disguised fetish, you have to lick the foot without pausing for even a moment while it stomps around. If you stop licking for even the briefest period, it will instantly regain all of its HP. This boss sucks. It is dramatically easier in co-op, since both players can coordinate to keep constant pressure up, but as a solo player, it's obscenely frustrating, and there's not even any indicator when two licks are far enough apart for its HP to refill. You just have to keep following the foot around in a circle and licking it until the game finally tells you you can stop. At this point, a UFO appears, and you climb in it and fly away, which is one of the last things I would have expected to happen after that boss fight, or at the end of this game in general. And it ends with a teaser for a sequel titled Snakes in Space, which never happened. They did put out a sequel on the Game Boy titled Sneaky Snakes, though. The next NES game in our list is Solar Jetman Hunt for the Golden Warpship. Your box may say Warship, but it's meant to be Warpship. Solar Jetman is an interesting inclusion in the Rare Replay collection, though, because Rare didn't actually make it. In the late 80s, Rare started hiring a company called Zippo Games for contract work, which eventually led to a complete purchase of the company by Rare. Zippo Games was run by the Pickford brothers, who later went on to make Plock, a game you've surely heard of before, right? Solar Jetman began life as Iota, an arcade shooter. It was an original project by Zippo Games, but it was being funded by Rare, and halfway through development they were told to make it a Jetman game, so Iota was renamed to Solar Jetman and the gameplay reworked to better fit the series. Solar Jetman was developed entirely by Zippo Games with little input from Rare themselves, aside from the soundtrack which was created by Rare's composer David Wise. 
Solar Jetman builds on the basic gameplay of the previous Jetman games with a focus on collecting items and returning them to your ship, much like in the original Jetpack. Unlike Jetpack, the levels in Solar Jetman are large and sprawling planets with intricate cave systems to explore. You pilot a small pod around the planet by turning it and then firing the thruster to move. Each planet has its own level of gravity which complicates maneuvering your pod and requires new adaptation with each level. Your pod has a limited fuel supply that can be refilled at the ship, which doubles as a health bar. The pod is incredibly fragile, taking high damage from bumping against the ground or walls and dying instantly to most enemy attacks. Once it's destroyed, you'll be left alone with just your spacesuit. In the suit, your maneuverability is drastically increased and you control more like Jetman did in the Spectrum releases. Jetman is highly vulnerable in this state though, so your main priority at this point should be to return to the ship and hop into a new pod. The object of the game is to collect enough fuel for your ship to blast off and then seek out the hidden piece of the golden warp ship. Along the way, you can also collect upgrades for your pod and valuables which convert into money you can spend between levels. The upgrades are substantial and crucial, with the first couple planets featuring several incredibly important ones you will not survive without. On the first planet, you find a shield system which can be raised and lowered at will to dramatically decrease damage taken. The downside to having your shield up is that you can't tow objects, so it has to be dropped when you're transporting items back to the ship. On the second planet are boosters which can be activated by holding select and pressing the thrust button. The booster is powerful but fuel inefficient and it is absolutely necessary for carrying heavy items in high gravity. Transporting objects is accomplished with a simple tow cable that automatically latches onto anything that can be towed if you approach with your shields down. Anything you pick up has weight to it though, with pod upgrades and warp ship pieces being particularly heavy. The added drag from towed objects combines with the gravity of the planet to really complicate movement during transport. You can always drop anything you're carrying by raising your shields though, if a heavy object is about to pull you down to the ground. You need to transport anything you find back to the ship for it to count as collected, but since the maps are so large in this game, there are helpful wormholes placed around each planet. Your pod can't pass through these, but if you manage to swing an item you're towing into it, it'll automatically return to the ship. If your pod is destroyed, you can also hop into these as Jetman for a quick escape. The warp ship pieces are always hidden on a separate screen accessed through a second type of wormhole, which only lets you in once you've collected all the fuel you need for takeoff. These small rooms always have a shortcut back to the ship for you to cram the ship piece into as well. Once you bring the warp ship piece back to your ship, you get to play a brief bonus stage, and then you're given the option to continue exploring or blast off to the next planet. After every couple of planets, you're given access to a store from which you can purchase upgrades for your pods with your hard-earned money. The store stock grows with each visit, and across the course of the game, you'll be able to purchase several permanent upgrades which include a mapping system, an upgraded map that shows collectible items, and two models of pod upgrades. There are also three different categories of consumable items to enhance your pod for a single trip out onto a planet. The pod model upgrades are very substantial. The second pod is able to tow around the shortcut variety of wormhole by approaching it with your shields down, allowing you to move them to more convenient spots. But they are extremely heavy. The third pod can no longer tow wormholes, but it can now warp between them, a much more useful feature than towing, which allows for rapid transit around the map. It also makes it much easier to get objects inside, since you can pass through yourself and pull them in behind you. The consumable items come in three categories. You can equip one item from each category for a single trip. The first category is made up of sub-weapons like homing missiles which consume ammunition and can be fired by holding select and pressing the fire button. The second category contains bullet upgrades that are just straight damage increases to your basic shot. The final category contains very powerful passive upgrades to your pods such as stronger thrusters, anti-gravity, and a momentum canceller. Making good use of these consumables can make the game dramatically less difficult. As you progress through the game, you travel from planet to planet, encountering new environments and enemies with different levels of gravity to contend with. The planets mix things up a lot and keep the gameplay fresh with features like water that your ship wants to float in or enemies that pull or push you around. There's even a planet where the gravity is completely reversed and you have to deal with a constant upwards force rather than the downwards one you've grown used to. There are a total of 12 warp ship pieces to collect and 12 main planets. There's also a secret 13th planet you can find which allows you to skip several of the late game levels. Once you've completed the warp ship, you're put into a Gradius-style side-scrolling shooter stage and have one try to reach the end and defeat the boss. There's only one golden warp ship, so if you die, it's game over. Solar Jetman is the first game we've looked at in this series with a save system though, so a game over isn't actually as big of a deal as it has been in the previous games. At the start of each planet, you're given a password save, so as long as you write those down, you'll never have to go back farther than the beginning of the last planet you landed on. There's no password for the final warp ship sequence though, so I hope you like replaying the final planet. 
As a whole, Solar Jetman is awesome. I had a ton of fun playing through it, and it took me about 6 hours to beat, which is roughly 6 times longer than most NES games. The planets are just different enough from each other that exploring a new one feels fresh and exciting, and the controls are easy to learn but satisfying to master. It may have been developed by a completely different studio and started life as a completely different game, but it's definitely one of the better NES games in Rare Replay. The collection proceeds to skip a few more shovelware releases until we get to Digger T. Rock, The Legend of the Lost City, a 1990 release published by Milton Bradley. Digger T. Rock is a puzzle platformer that takes place in a series of caverns, with your objective being to descend through eight individual stages to reach the Lost City. Each cavern's exit is blocked by a heavy steel door which can be opened by finding and standing on a pressure plate. The door only stays open for 60 seconds at a time though, so you need to have your route planned and cleared out in advance. Digger is armed only with a shovel, but you can find rocks around to throw instead. The game tries to dynamically decide whether you want to throw a rock or swing your shovel based on how close you are to enemies, but it doesn't work very well. Fighting enemies in general is probably the worst part of this game, but thankfully there aren't very many of them, with the main obstacle being the environment itself. Like many spelunking games, falling from a great height will damage you, but as you explore you can find rope ladders that can be dropped down pits to create a safe way down and back up again. You can also find explosives to clear out thin walls, and diamonds which can be used to distract greedy enemies. Or you can spend them in one of the stores located in caverns 4 and 7 to purchase supplies. There are also hidden mushrooms you can find by poking at specific nondescript pieces of the environment. You can then kick these mushrooms, which will release a spore, and then if you collect the spore, you turn pink and become invincible like Super Mario when he eats a power star. It's a bizarre, pointless mechanic that I played through the entire game without realizing exists and without feeling like anything was missing at all. Digger T Rock is a fun, slower-paced game. You're encouraged to take your time fully exploring each cavern to collect supplies and plot out a route from the pressure switch to the door. As you get deeper, the caverns get bigger and more intricate, while never getting so difficult that the game starts to feel unreasonable like a lot of Rare's NES releases do. All in all, it's a simple, solid little game, and it's a nice way to spend an hour or two. But to be honest, it's just not very remarkable. They set out to make a fun, simple little cave exploring game, and they succeeded. I really don't know what else to say about it, I just don't have any remarks. So I'll move on to the next game in Rare Replay, Battletoads. As I said before, I'm not going to be going in depth on Battletoads, because I intend to do a full series retrospective on it in the near future, but we'll touch on it for a little bit real quick. Battletoads presents itself as a standard side-scrolling beat-em-up game, and I guess it's primarily that, but much like Cobra Triangle, Battletoads is constantly mixing up the gameplay and throwing new challenges at you. Every level has some new gimmick, but the core beat-em-up gameplay is usually present in some capacity. Battletoads is, was, and always will be known for its absurdly high difficulty level. Beating Battletoads at all was a badge of honor and a point of pride for any kid, and if you did it without an infinite lives code, well, to be honest, your friends might not believe you. The big thing that sets Battletoads apart from a lot of other Nintendo hard games is the fact that an infinite lives code doesn't really make most of the game easier, it just stops you from being sent all the way back to the first level. In a lot of the games we've talked about in this video, nearly all of them really, turning on infinite lives has an immediately noticeable effect on difficulty, allowing you to just ignore mechanics whose only punishment is the loss of a life. And that's true of a lot of Battletoads as well, but this game also features obscenely difficult long stretches of gameplay that send you back to the start upon death. The most infamous one that you've certainly heard of is the Turbo Tunnel. The Turbo Tunnel is only infamous because it's a filter though. Rat Race and Klinger Winger make the Turbo Tunnel look like Kirby's Dreamland, but they're at the end of the game so most people never see them. Infinite lives don't help when you're required to play perfectly. I don't want to spend too long on Battletoads in this episode, but considering its significance to this era of Rare's history, I couldn't just skip over it entirely. Throughout this entire video, I've commented on the high difficulty of various parts of all of these games, but Battletoads is unique in how difficult it continues to be even if you fully utilize every cheat Rare Replay provides you. Even the rewind doesn't help as much as you would think. It's not the hardest game I've ever played, but I believe it's earned its reputation as one of the hardest games of all time. Moving on from Battletoads for now, the next and final game we're going to be talking about in this video is RC Pro-Am 2, released in December of 1992, well after the release of the Super Nintendo. RC Pro-Am 2 is in sort of an odd spot. It's better than the first game in just about every way, but it also feels very derivative without a whole lot to set it apart from the game that came out nearly five years prior. It's a really great NES racing game, but so is RC Pro-Am. Much like the first game, Pro-Am 2 has you race against three rival cars across a campaign of 24 tracks, requiring you to place at least third to proceed. 
There's also a new scoring system added, granting points based on your placing in each race. The upgrade system from Pro-Am 1 makes a return, but heavily refined. Rather than picking up car parts during races, you instead collect cash lying on the track, which can then be spent on upgrades, weapons, and additional continues between each race. You're also awarded money depending on your placing in each race, so more gold trophies means a better car. And your opponents upgrade their cars as well, of course. Also returning from Pro-Am 1 are the letters which upgrade the model of your car. Rather than spelling out Nintendo or Champion though, this time you just spell out Pro-Am 2. Once again, you can upgrade twice in this way. Your opponents can also upgrade their model, but they have to collect the letters for themselves, unlike in the first game where they just get upgraded alongside your own car. Between each race, you're placed at a store and allowed to spin your winnings before proceeding on to the next race. You can upgrade your engine and tires like in the previous game, and you can also purchase other useful items, like a nitro boost you can activate during the race for a burst of speed. Nitro containers can also be found on certain racetracks, but buying it before the race guarantees you'll have a boost if you need one. Weaponry also makes a return, also purchased via the new store rather than collected on the tracks. The missiles and bombs from the first game make a return, along with new weapons like the Buckshot, which steals money from your opponents. I get it? Buckshot? Bucks, like money! I just realized this while I was writing this script, I had no idea why they called it that when I was playing, I was wondering when the deer were gonna show up. Aside from the store visits, the game will also occasionally break things up with a bonus game between races. There are two bonus games, Tug of War and Drag Race. Both of them are functionally identical, you just alternate the A and B buttons as fast as you can. The bonus games also award cash and race points based on your placing like races do, but they give less. The tracks are more intricate than they were in the first game as well. Every eight races, the visual aesthetics change to give the game a bit more variety. You start on standard race tracks like in Pro-Am 1, then move on to racing through a city before finishing things out by off-roading in the desert. Tracks in general are bigger and more complicated than they were in the previous game, with frequent changes in elevation and track conditions, and is that guy bombing the racetrack? Why is he doing that? Are we racing through a war zone? The single player campaign is fun and an improvement over the first games, but the real defining feature of RC Pro-Am 2 is the multiplayer. Pro-Am 1 was an entirely single player experience, but Pro-Am 2 not only allows for two players to race, but if you had the NES 4 score multi-tap accessory, four players could race each other simultaneously. This sounds like a completely mundane and expected feature for a racing game, but at the time it was kind of impressive. Critics more or less universally praised the multiplayer, even if they found the single player was just passable. Playing both games back to back in quick succession made all the improvements of Pro-Am 2 really stand out to me, but I can see how a 4 to 5 year wait for an only marginally improved sequel was disappointing to players at the time. It really does feel like playing more of the same game, but just a little bit better across the board. And that's why I say Pro-Am 2 is in kind of a weird spot. It's absolutely better than the first game in a vacuum, but the first game defined a genre and led the way for industry giants like Mario Kart, while the second game is just a pretty good iteration of the first one that came out five years after it would have been impressive. It has a big legacy to live up to, and being a little better just isn't enough. Especially when it had SNES and Genesis games to compete with. And that's the final NES game in Rare Replay, and the final NES exclusive Rare released in general, followed only by Battletoads and Double Dragon, which also had a release on 16-bit platforms. Rare's NES library is a mess of garbage with a handful of diamonds buried inside it, but those diamonds are generally a lot of fun and worth trying out today if you can deal with a little bit of frustration. All in all, I think their good NES games age dramatically better than their Spectrum releases did, but a lot of that can probably be attributed to the NES hardware just being better for video games than the Spectrum was. After these last couple NES releases, Rare changed their business model up once again as they moved on to more advanced platforms. While their strategy for the NES was to release as many games as they possibly could as quickly as they possibly could, they decided to shift into a quality over quantity approach going forward, focusing solely on the higher effort releases that once defined them as a developer. They were late arriving to the SNES platform though. Used to being ahead of the curve, Rare was now behind the competition and needed something to set them apart from the rest. So they gathered up their massive profits from all the licensed garbage they put out on the NES and invested in expensive silicon graphics workstations for creating 3D models. After releasing like 400 Battletoads games in a row, Rare put together a tech demo for Nintendo utilizing their new silicon graphics technology. Nintendo was impressed once again by the demo Rare put together and presented an offer. Rare was to create a game for the Super Nintendo utilizing their new silicon graphics and they could use a Nintendo IP to do it. Rare chose Donkey Kong, and history was made. What followed was one of the most revered and beloved series of games in Nintendo's history. 
In the next episode, we're going to talk all about Donkey Kong Country. But for now, the video has reached its end. If you want to see and hear all about these groundbreaking games, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next episode. Thank you all for watching to the end. If you like this video and you're interested in seeing the other 40-ish games Rare vomited out onto the NES platform, leave a comment below and I'll look into putting a video together. But for now, this is Ashley, still licking that foot, and signing out.